So good afternoon. I would like to thank first the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present today some of our recent and unpublished data on mechanism of uh, e-proteinic persistence in CLL. So these are my disclosures, which have actually nothing to do with what I present today. So with um, the more broad use of iProteinib for the treatment of CLL patients, uh, we know now that uh, resistance to this drug is not rare and overcoming this resistance is of high clinical need. Uh, so whereas patients that um, suffer from progressive disease uh, during iProteinib treatment uh, later than uh, one year of, of treatment often show um, mutations in BTK and PLC gamma, this is different in patients that relapse early within a year. These patients often uh, show a transformation into a more aggressive uh, transformed disease. So uh, the aim of our project was to uh, generate a preclinical model uh, to study underlying mechanism of iProteinib resistance and also to have a tool uh, to study new therapeutic approach for this hard to treat uh, disease. So we take use of the TCR1 mouse model and Shishi did a nice introduction to this mouse model. So what we do is we are using uh, the malignant cells uh, from the spleen of these mice and we are transplanting these malignant leukemia cells into syngenic young mice and thereby generate uh, homogeneous cohorts of uh, mice with, uh, which develop leukemia within weeks. So uh, we used this uh, uh, adoptive transfer approach and started treatment uh, with iProteinib two weeks after tumor cell transplantation. And as shown also by other groups, um, iProteinib nicely prevented leukemia development uh, in this setting. As you can see here, compared to vehicle, where we have development of leukemia within weeks. So this is the tumor load in the blood of those mice. Uh, the iProteinib treated mice uh, nicely um, uh, kept low levels of leukemia cells in the blood. But if we went on treating uh, these mice um, over longer periods, what we observed is that um, these mice uh, lost treatment response to iProteinib, which is shown here after five and six weeks of treatment, we observed a rapid increase in uh, leukemia growth in the mice. And this um, uh, is actually nicely um, um, uh, confirmed with when we looked at the proliferation rate of uh, those leukemia cells in the mice, whereas at the early time point, which is week one of treatment, we see a tremendous difference between vehicle, where we have up to 80% of proliferating cells, which was extremely reduced in iProteinib-treated mice, but this effect was completely abolished uh, at the later treatment time point when the mice got uh, resistance where the proliferative ra uh, rate was similar in vehicle and iProteinib treated animals. So to see whether this iProteinib resistance is uh, cell intrinsic, we went uh, for a second treatment round where we used then uh, tumors from previously vehicle or iProteinib treated mice and transplanted them again in syngenic young mice and uh, started a second treatment round. And on, on the left side, you nicely see that we reconfirm the data that I just showed you. Uh, we first see um, a treatment response in mice that for the first time C I proteinib, which gets lost over time here after five and six weeks of treatment, again loss of treatment response. But then if you look now on the right side, these are now the mice that had been uh, transplanted with uh, leukemia cells from previously I proteinib treated animals and there there's no uh, difference observed anymore, uh, meaning that those cells have an cell intrinsic uh, resistance mechanism against uh, the drug. So to now um, study the underlying mechanisms of iProteinib resistance, we sorted leukemic cells uh, from uh, a lay, uh, an early treatment uh, time point, which was one week of treatment, and also from end-stage uh, disease mice, which is after three weeks of treatment in the vehicle cohort and six weeks of treatment uh, in the iProteinib-treated mice. And we, with these flow-sorted cells, we performed exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and attack sequencing. And in the exome sequencing, we did not observe um, any mutations in PTK or PLC gamma and also no other recurrent mutations. That is why I'm concentrating today my presentation on the RNA sequencing data. 
where we saw a nice clustering of, uh, of the samples according to what was expected. So the transcriptomic profile was most similar in both vehicle-treated arms, the early and the late, and the most distinct transcriptional profile we observed actually in the, um, in the cells from mice that um, got eprotinib resistant. So we used now the differential expressed genes between the e-protinib resistant and sensitive uh, cells and the gene set enrichment analysis. And what was quite interesting when we looked at the gene sets that showed a similar um, set of genes, we found uh, six out of the top 10 gene sets that were enriched were related or were derived from T cell. Uh, experiments. These are the ones that are labeled here in blue, and down here you see two examples of T effector uh, cell gene sets. So this fits quite nicely, and, and actually only one, which is labeled here in red, uh, was a gene set that was derived from B cells. So this um, fits quite nicely to what we heard uh, this morning from Christopher Blass who actually showed us that by epigenetic data, they identified that CLL cells are actually uh, able to express genes that are more well known from actually from T cells. So among those genes that were differentially expressed uh, in between the eprotinib uh, resistant and sensitive cells was the transcription factor TBET, which is a very well-known transcription factor in T cell biology because it is the main driver of T helper one cell differentiation. This transcription factor is also associated with terminal differentiation of CD8 and CD4 effector T cells. But in the meantime, it is also known that TBET is not only expressed in T cell, where it was first de described, but also in many different other cell types of myeloid and lymphoid lineages. And if you look now at our data concerning TBET expression, uh, compared to the vehicle-treated animals, we find a down-regulation of TBET expression after one week of iprotinib treatment. This is in the sensitive cells. But then if you look at the iprotinib resistant cells, uh, TBET expression is strongly upregulated. So, we confirmed that by flow cytometry, whether we really can detect TBET uh, protein on, in these cells, and this is now quantification of flow cytometry data, where we actually really detect TBET expression in CD CD19, CD5 double positive leukemia cells. And uh, the quantification shows you also, uh, we confirm that iprotinib treatment is reducing TBET expression in these cells. And when we go to the second round of treatment where we have uh, iprotinib resistant cells, this downregulation is almost abolished, confirming more or less what we have seen uh, in the transcriptome data. <laughs> So to make sure that this is not only um, characteristics uh, of the TCO1 um, mouse model, we went now also into uh, clinical samples, and this is in collaboration with Jan Berger, where we um, actually analyzed TBED expression by flow cytometry in CLL cells under um, eprotinib treatment. So first of all, we did detect TBET in um, primary CLL cells from patient, and the level of TBET expression was definitely higher compared to normal uh, B cells from healthy individuals. And if you look now in the um, uh, pretreated uh, cells compared to over-treatment, we, we again com confirmed that uh, up on uh, iProtinib treatment, uh, TBET is downregulated. After three and six months of treatment, we find significantly less expression of TBET. So, uh, among the top regulated genes of TBET is um, the chemokine receptor CXCR3. Um, uh, and its ligands, C uh, CXCL9 and 10, and CXCL, uh, CXCL11 are involved in uh, the recruitment of trafficking of lymphocytes, mainly again extra, uh, ex um, explored in T cells so far. So that is why we also got interested in CXCR3. And again, we measured now CXCR. Uh, X3 expression in uh, normal B cells and CLL cells, and these are now paired samples from the same patients. And as you can see, uh, the CLL cells, CD5, CD19 double positive cells in these patients show a higher expression of CXCR3 compared to the normal B cells in that same individuals. That also shows us that CXCR3 expression is not only induced by the inflammatory microenvironment in the patient, but is rather really um, um, an intrinsic feature of the malignant cells. 
Uh, so we used now the same cohort of iProtinib patients and measured also CXCR3 levels in those cases. And very similar, like TBED, we uh, observed a lower expression or a down regulation of CXCR3 now in those cases that received iProtinib treatment for three and six months compared to the pre-treated samples. So this brings me now to the summary and conclusion of our data. So we have generated an iProtinib resistance model using the TCR1 mouse line, and we show that iProtinib resistance in these mice is driven by transcriptional adaptation rather than genetic mutation, and it is also associated with an induction of T-cell-specific genes. So we come now to the following working model that we are following up on. So CLL cells are associated with an induced expression or an upregulated expression of TBET and CXCR3 among uh, different other T cell related genes. Up on iprotinib treatment, those genes get downregulated on the cells. And when uh, we um, observe resistance against iProtinib in the mouse model, we again find an upregulation at least of TBIT, of the transcription factor TBIT. So what does this mean for the biology of the cells? So uh, we assume that TBIT is relevant for the activation and proliferation of the CLL cells. We can inhibit it this with iProtinib and up on resistance development, this leads then to enhanced proliferation of the cells. CXCR3 might be certainly also involved in homing and migration of the CLL cells. We know that uh, upon iProtinib treatment, uh, CLL cells get mobilized to the peripheral blood. CXCR3 might be involved in that. This is what we are currently also testing in the mouse model. So this brings me to the last slide, to the acknowledgments. I would like to thank the, my team in Heidelberg, uh, specifically uh, uh, Laminia Arseni. She's also here in the audience today. Hani Yastan Parast and Philip Rösner, who produced this data. I would like to also acknowledge the bioinformatics team within our division, who did also all the uh, bioinformatics analysis of sequencing data, our collaboration partners, and the funding through the Fire CLL program um, of the Euro uh, funding. And thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Martina. Anyone for questions? Maybe I can start with one, Martina. Yeah. So, um, do you invariably see ibrutinib resistance occurring in your TCL1 adoptive mouse? And that's an interesting question. It is not the same over all clones. So, we have tested in the meantime several clones. So, there are qualitative and quantitative differences. So, but we don't know yet the let's say, the reason for this. Genetically, they are not so much different. So it cannot be the genetics itself, but we are looking into that. So there definitely there is some heterogeneity be between one TCO1 mouse clone and the other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, there's one. Yeah. Uh, very, Michael. very interesting work. Um, just a quick question, maybe I not, uh, did not get every, everything, but uh, how could, uh, could TCL1 interfere with the mechanisms that you observe here and, uh, and with the mutations that we usually see? So in other words, it's a little bit the question of relevance, although I, I very much support your hypothesis because that's what we see in other models as well, but still, uh, could it be that there is an artificial element in the model that you're using here and uh, does it also mimic the effects of the mutations that we usually see in ibrutinib resistant mm -hmm. patients, PLC gamma and BTK yeah. mutations? So in the role of TCL1, that's a very interesting question. And I mean, we are currently analyzing our ATEC-seq uh, data because we definitely want to find out, um, let's say, the transcription factor network that is driving this resistance mechanism. And we have identified already a um, couple of uh, transcription factors that where we find more open uh, chromatin region in our ATEC toxic data in the resistant cells. And uh, so TCL1 might be among them, but this is something that is currently still under uh, investigation. TCL1 is also overexpressed in human CLL, so it could be a similar mechanism there as well. And then concerning the second question, uh, which uh, deals with mutations. So I think what we are seeing in our model probably more reflects um, the different, um, let's say the resistance mechanism that is seen quite early, where, we have, where you have a transformed 
disease and rather not uh, reflecting uh, patients that get resistance over a long time of treatment where you then acquire mutations in BTK and PLC gamma rather. So I think the time frame is just too short for this clonal evolution, mutational evolution that um, happens over, over many, many months. So you see, we see uh, this resistance already popping up after five, six weeks of treatment. So it's more um, reflecting. Yeah. Okay, I think we are running out of time, but thank thanks a lot for your questions.